Thanks very much, everybody. I'd like to thank the UCLA Anderson School of Management for having me tonight, inviting me to talk with these two great titans, and thank you all for being here. Um, a warm welcome to the alumni in the audience. Welcome home. And also a welcome and hello to uh, media representatives that we have in the audience. I uh, would like to remind you that this conversation is off the record. That's Let with you too. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Got it. Let me begin with, with your relationship. When I was calling around talking to people about uh, having the opportunity to sit down with you both, people said, I thought they weren't friends. What happened? I thought they had a, had a breakup. Tell me. What happened when you managed to um, part ways and, and start BlackRock from Blackstone and, um, and how you all got started? Tell, let's start there. Well, those are two questions, how we got started or how we got... How, Tell me what <laughs> happened when you, when you um, were separated. Um, I think the start is Thanks, better. Steve. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we're here together. I was at Steve's party. We're still friends. We saw each other in Florida last year. So uh, the rumors that we're not friends is uh, totally incorrect. And uh, as I would say, uh, in our business, uh, it, uh, with even some wisdom, um, it's um, it is very hard to have uh, long friends. Um, and I would qualify Steve as a long friend. So um, you know, we did. Uh, have an opportunity to build BlackRock away from Blackstone, but that had nothing to do with our relationships. Um, and we still, BlackRock actually manages a lot of, of Blackstone's money. Uh, so, you know, be it in liquidity or other areas where they have needs that we could fill the needs. So I would say. Uh, our, our marriage is a lot more fun to talk about than the actual separation. Actually, we had we had a good time, even even even, even when we were uh, separating. Larry wanted to uh, uh, to sell the business. We actually didn't want to right. uh, because I, I thought that Larry was uh, the best manager of a financial services uh, company that I had, had ever. Uh, uh, seen and, and, and at that point it was smaller, but it started at nothing when we started the company together, uh, and and it was growing extremely rapidly. And uh, you know, I, I, we we hit a bad patch in the markets, um, as I remember it, uh, where mortgage securities uh, you know went 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 down, and uh, you know Larry and his partners wanted to sell the business and. I think they were concerned about what the future would be uh, and we were at a wrong. certain level. And I definitely didn't want to sell it. And, and Larry would say, well, why, why don't you want to sell it? We could make a bunch of money. And, and I said, uh, and he said, there's a bunch of risk right now. And I, and I, I said, uh, I know there's a bunch of risk, but betting on you is the safest bet that I'll ever make because you'll come up with something new. Uh, you'll come up with new products, with new things we can do and, and, and so forth. And, and uh, uh, you know, I still uh, uh, believe that about Larry. And, and, and I think uh, that uh, that's turned out to be absolutely true. Uh, if, you, if you look at when we started, what was that, 1989 or 8? 1988. 88. And you now look, look uh, you know, sort of, what is it, 19 years, managing a trillion dollars. Uh, you know, finance is an intangible business. It's really about the gifts of the people. Uh, and Larry and his colleagues are amazingly uh, uh, gifted, talented, energetic, focused, and, and look at what they've built. So, uh, you know, my, my hat is off to Larry and, and always, uh, always has been because he's, he's got unique uh, personal talent. I mean, you know, if, if, if there was any kind of place where you need somebody to lead you, uh, you know, sort of into combat, let Larry is the guy. Uh, How have you been leaping into combat recently? You mentioned a rough patch. It, it sort of feels like we've entered... Really, it feels like a rough patch to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Are, have you made any changes to your approach, given these new worries about recession and the market upset of late? Not really. Um, you know, the market setback that we all talk about was really a few-day event. Um, 
we, we actually um, were anticipating um, some digestion in the marketplace. The market has been just too easy, and with it, and now with this uh, semi setback, we're starting to see people um, uh, look at risk a little different ways. And the marketplace really needed that because the market was trading like there is no risk anywhere. And, and so. The biggest problem we have is not just the setback. The biggest problem we have today and how we have to look at managing assets differently, unlike any other time, the world is very correlated. And so we, this contagion started in China and met to Europe and went to the U.S. and hit other markets. And so you could see the correlation. So investing in a, in a global way, when there is going to be a setback, it's going to be hard to avoid uh, not feeling some pain. And so, you know, we have to navigate through these setbacks, but the reality is uh, having the market appreciate risk is a good thing. Is that the way you see it, Steve? Well, we, we, we benefit in the kind of businesses we're in. Uh, sometimes when the markets get bad, uh, stocks go down, uh, we can buy companies cheaper, or if we can't buy them cheaper, somebody will sell them to us because they're scared. Uh, you know, in a, in a world where there's no risk premium, people believe that trees will grow to the sky and, and you know, sometimes they don't want to sell you the company except at a price where you really don't want to be a buyer. There's always that tension, uh, but, you know, particularly at times, you know, when there's uh, no, no risk premium. So, you know, we, we, we've learned that, you know, all of us who've, who've, who've been in the financial business for a long time, that, that there, are, there are big cycles and, you know, you have these uh, sort of small mm -hmm. little warning signs that, People, uh, you know, used to not uh, uh, overreact to as much, but because of the, the linkage uh, now um, uh, of all these global markets and you know CNBC and and you know I guess you have a competitor or two and and you know all these little machines, all these little machines <laughs> on people's desk. It used to be when we started in the business, it's hard to imagine. Uh, you know, and, and I'm not that old, I don't think, but. You know, we, we didn't have, you know, like calculators. And if you wanted, uh, you talk about database management, okay? You, you, you went to a room where there were uh, uh, basically about 75 years uh, of, of copies of the Wall Street Journal uh, and the New York Times. I must say the Wall Street Journal was much higher quality because you didn't get as much ink all over you. And, and, and if you wanted to find out what stock prices were, over a five-year period or a ten-year period or whatever it was, you went to that issue, you opened it up, and you, you know, sort of put it on your little piece of paper. And then that's, that was database management in 19, uh, 1972. And, and so, you know, people forget uh, in finance uh, uh, the just, just complete revolution. Uh, that's happened where, 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 where data and information is global and, and it affects the way everybody. And immediate. Uh, right. It is so fast that everybody's linked and it affects Larry's uh, types of businesses much more than ours. We're, we're for the most part in slow motion, uh, you know, and takes us a while to adjust, whereas Larry's in a business with a trillion dollars of assets, bang, that is like instantaneous. Yeah, but I mean, Larry's saying that, you know, the, the credit story has been really so great. It certainly has been a great support of your business. Is there still then, or is there a bubble in the credit markets? Is that where the bubble is, Larry? Yes. I mean, it's the, the credit markets are, are well, I, stepping back, I think uh, private equity is playing this arbitrage right now. And the ability for private equity to transact so many deals um, with such ease is because of the liquidity in the credit markets. So financing a $20 billion bank loan, which was unheard of three years ago, can be done in days or hours, I mean, in a very short period of time. And it just is a good example of the, of the availability of credit and liquidity. Uh, if you just look at the credit markets, credit is, there is very little spread between 
a triple A credit and a single A credit and a double B credit, and so and the availability of credit in the lower tiers of credit is enormous today. So, um, with a low funding cost of borrowing, um, it makes it much easier for private equity to finance their transaction, um, and, and so. It is my opinion that credit is mispriced. Um, it is mispriced because most financial institutions, most pension funds cannot earn the adequate return versus their liabilities with a 10-year around 450 and credit spreads at 100 or 100 and whatever they are. Uh, so it's very hard to make an adequate return today with this inverted yield curve with a 55 6% uh, asset yield, and um, and so what they're doing, more and more companies are stretching in different forms of credit, um, and that's bringing down the the credit spread. But what it's doing is, it's in our opinion, it's the lower grade credits are being are totally mispriced, and uh, and the private equity market is able to arbitrage that by using that and the availability of credit and and buying companies. So how worried are you that, that this reverses at some point and the music stops? I mean, clearly the credit story has been one of the key supporters of you being able to do the d bigger and bigger deals. Well, th things always reverse. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of like when I, I read some articles about somebody uh, yammering on about how defaults are going to escalate. Well, defaults are at a 26-year low. Right. Of course they're going to go up. <laughs> uh, I mean, so, so it, it all depends, you know, whether you understand the context, uh, you know, of, of where you're operating, and, and right now we're, we're operating in a very uh, 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 hospitable uh, environment. And one reason I think, Lara, that 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 credit spreads are, are are so low and basically money so available is with because you have a world that that's got like record low, not record low, for for healthy economies, extremely low. Uh, inflation, mm -hmm. uh, and and that includes emerging markets, and, and I think the reason for that is is unprecedented levels of uh, global productivity, uh, and and that productivity is just really, uh, you know, a, a deflationary uh, element, uh, and and so you can have this uh, really quite good uh, growth with 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 uh, quite low interest rates which gives us a lower cost of capital because of what Larry's talking about with the spreads than a regular corporation, uh, to, which, which is less leveraged, unbelievably, just because our, our, you know, we, we put so much debt on that's, that's only a tiny bit more expensive than theirs. Say we put 80 cents of debt or 75 cents of debt onto a credit and, 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 and our, our requirement for return on equity, say it's 20, corporations trying to get 15, but it's got, 60 or 70 percent, uh, uh, you know, equity. Uh, so, so we we have, you know, our borrowing costs are probably what seven and a half, uh, uh, eight, and then it's tax affected, and it's, so you get down to, you know, sort of five percent cost of money or something. If you don't make, you know, before leverage and eight or nine percent on equity, then you right. have leverage and you win. You win. You win. And, and, that's, that, and, and you that's the arbitrage. Winning, and right. you keep seeing more money. But, flowing in. But, but more money will come in and then you keep doing more deals and then it's like all cycles. You and know? something's going to blow so up. Don't the something, returns have to come down, bottom line? Uh, the, the returns, people have been saying that to me since uh, we started in 87. Uh, I always get the same question. Whether okay. it's, well, basically, it's usually from, from consultants uh, who are trying to uh, interview us to, for their pension funds. Well, there's so much money now, and these deals, your returns are going down. The returns, you know, have you never know, I, gone I, down. I think most people have miscalculated how large the global yes. capital markets have grown, and it has grown so dramatically that that that's where I mean, where consultants are asking the questions. Right. It, it, it's the capital markets are, are growing so rapidly, um, even as private equity transactions are are headline news. They're actually small right. relative to the global capital markets. Let me also talk about one that's re one thing that's really so equity office is small in the global capital well, markets. Just, just 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 to amplify the point, I was at a conference where David Bonderman was talking, and not to misrepresent David, he's the head of uh, a company TCP. called Texas Pacific, uh, which does buyouts and some other things. And David was saying that 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 
that private equity represented something like 4% of the global, the, you know, all the deals we do, 4% of the global, yeah, yeah, so am I, uh, you know, <laughs> 3 or 4% of the global capital market. So it's, it's really sort of a, you know, it, it seems large, but, but these markets are now so big, and as private equity is growing, the rest of the world is not standing still. Right. I mean, it's, it's really getting bigger. Could you see yourself doing a hundred billion dollar deal? Uh, I, I don't. I don't think like that. <laughs> yes, I, I could. I could. <laughs> no, not necessarily uh, Blackstone, but could I see a hundred billion dollar transaction in the private equity world? Sure. If, you know, I mean, obviously, it's it, the, if it's a good company, credit will be available in this market environment. Let me talk about how the interrelated of the markets are. So. Japan Post, which is the largest institution in the world, it has three trillion dollars of money. Historically, the Japan Japanese government borrowed money from the Japanese Post, and now they're going to try to privatize the Japanese Post. Well, in 19, in 2006, the government paid back 400 billion dollars to the Japanese Post. And the Japanese Post invested that in Japanese bonds, and that's why we have Japanese bonds so cheap, and that's why we have the the, the yen arbitrage. You know, people are borrowing in yen because rates are so low, and buying emerging markets, buying equities. So you could just see, okay, a movement by the government of Japan into the Japanese Post. Japanese Post right now is buying JGBs, but. It's forcing other people because of low financing rates in Japan now to invest in global. So you can see the interconnectivity of the world, which is truly remarkable. And everyone talks about the yen trade, and the yen trade is happening because interest rates are so low, and interest rates are so low because of the, the, the sheer liquidity in Japan. Tell us more about Japan. You recently, you just got back, or uh, recently, and you said that things uh, feel good to you. I mean, we've had head fakes before in Japan. Um, the market there has been going up, and you're seeing um, the banking system, people are talking about it, actually uh, as healthy as it has been in a long time. Well, it's all relative. They had a 15-year recession that really, it, it, it stopped. Um, and it is much better today. I mean, GDP is growing there, but it's growing at a very small rate versus what, how, what we think of good growth rate is. It's, you know, two-ish percent. Uh, uh, and it's growing principally because of it is the close proximity to China and other parts of Southeast Asia. They're benefiting from huge exporting, um, and and so they they have been in this global economy. Japan is a big beneficiary of this global economy, um, and and they're able to build manufacturing plants throughout Southeast Asia, um, and so you know I think they will continue to be successful and. It, I actually think Japan is a, is a very good place to be investing in right now. you agree with that, Steve? And, and where around the world do you see opportunity? Well, you know, I agree with uh, Larry uh, almost all the time, but, but uh, you know, I, I certainly agree on that you one. You didn't agree when we... <laughs> no, that's, uh, well, <laughs> that's true. You were right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I knew there was something. Uh, the, the, uh, um, uh, yes, we, we agree. We're, we're, we're going to be uh, opening, uh, you know, sort of a real estate business uh, in Japan now and private equity and we were there uh, for 10 years actually from uh, 87, 87 to 97 and uh, you know it was really tough to do business uh, there from 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 90 to 97 and seven years like a long dry hole uh, and you know and it kept going for another uh, sort of eight or nine yeah. uh, but you know we, we see Japan uh, coming out of this and and you know, um, uh, as, as you look for, for a lot of the businesses that we're in, um, which are investment businesses, we have some advisory activities, but a lot of them are, you know, alternative asset uh, investments. As, as you look at India, where we have an operation, um, it's an economy. Uh, by the way, nobody knows how to measure any of these economies. I, I'm convinced, but but you know, they say it's like eight to nine percent. And if you go to a meeting with their planning officers, they're talking about ratcheting it up another, you know, 75 to 150 basis points. And eight to nine percent growth. Yes, growth. Yeah. And in India. In India, and you know, we opened first in that part of the world in India because, um, I, you know, I, I felt I could at least sort of understand the language, uh, and, and they do have laws, and and uh, and they were growing almost the same as as China. They were probably, 
200 basis points off of China, but, but, but they were at least you know, 12 to 15 years delayed in their reforms compared to when China reformed. So, so, so the Indian mantra uh, uh, is, is that wait, wait until you know, we get that extra 10 to 15 years and measure us then compared to where China is today. But in any case, you know, you've got extremely rapid growth there. You've got rapid growth in China. Uh, actually, right now, you have the entire world growing. Uh, you know, uh, Which is uh, pretty extraordinary. Much. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty extraordinary. It's, it's, it's a great time for us. But, but you know, it's, it's tough for us to actually put money out, unlike the businesses that Larry's in. Uh, it's tough for us to put money out in a lot of these economies because culturally, uh, in Asia, people don't like selling companies. Uh, and, and in fact, it's worse. Or the family the, run. Right, the right. They, they, it's viewed as a sign of, of, of defeat to sell a business. Uh, in, in, in the States, as, as you all know, you know, people, you know, you can pass a business on, but if you grow a business and you sell it and you make enormous amounts of money, people, you know, at your country club don't think you're a loser in the game of life. <laughs> if, if you did that uh, in some of the Asian countries, they would think you were a loser. Uh, you know, they wouldn't understand whatever motivated you. So for us, in terms when you say, well, where are you expanding? We, we're expanding in these places, but with much more uh, modest uh, expectations. And also, leverage buyouts don't work there as much. They're really rapidly growing economies, so you're really doing growth uh, investing. It's almost like mid-market growth investing, um, uh, you know, in, in, in often minorities with, with families. And it's a different type of uh, investment where you won't make returns that are necessarily as high as they will in a, a slower growing economy where you can leverage them as much because there there's very little leverage typically and, and you're basically buying into the growth rate. But so the opportunity you have is in, and we have is in, is in real estate. Yes. I mean, real estate, uh, yeah. you know. Around the world. Yeah, but especially in Asia. We have offices in Mumbai. We have, you know, we manage $50 billion in Japan. Um, and I would say most of our domestic clients who we manage real estate for are asking us to put more and more money outside of the United States. And they're looking for more global real estate opportunities. And, and yeah, we've been doing that in, uh, in, in Europe very successfully. Uh, and I, I think Asia, uh, from, from what we've seen so far, uh, looks good. It's a, it's a slightly different market than the other places in the world. It's more of a developer's market because when you get a rapidly growing economy, in, in effect, they need new stuff. Uh, when you're in Europe, uh, and I know this doesn't sound like rocket science, but when you've got economies that as, as a group are growing very, very slowly, there's not a need for a lot of new stuff, right? So, so there's much less you know, development uh, uh, opportunity in Europe and, and vastly more. Uh, in uh, non-Japan, uh, uh, Asia. I like to find out really the differences between the real estate market in Asia versus here. But, but let me get back to that. I don't want to run out of time. Talk to us a little about this this um, change in sentiment that seems to be taking hold about private equity over the last year or so, in terms of the new challenges you're facing. You've got in Europe on the one hand unions saying, look. We want a code of conduct. We want, to know, we want some answers when you take over companies. We want to make sure these jobs are safe. And then in the U.S., you've got an increasing uh, sound in Washington saying, look, they're making 20% on these deals, and, they're, and we want to change the tax structure and, and tax them as ordinary income, uh, which, of course, would make things so much more expensive for you. How are you dealing with that? Well, the, the European uh, dialogue uh, re really occurred as a result of a confluence of events, the private equity industry not talking about what they're doing. Uh, uh, one or two deals with deep personnel uh, cuts. Uh, uh, unions who are looking for uh, uh, a cause uh, and, and journalists looking for stories. Uh, and and they, they, they all combined uh, for some kind of combustible uh, event. Uh, the uh, uh, allegations that, that have been leveled at the private equity uh, industry, particularly in Europe, which is where this stuff's all feeding from, uh, le led by the unions are, 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 are pretty much, uh, uh, you know, uh, incorrect. Uh, and no one was telling another side of the story. In fact, in Europe, um, you know, uh, let's just back off one sec. The private equity business makes the most amount of money when you build a company, have it rapidly growing, uh, you know, uh, uh, dramatically increasing net income, 
and somebody will pay you a higher P multiple uh, for that kind of company than one that where you basically just cut some costs, businesses are growing much, and that's not too interesting, particularly in a world where interest rates go up. Uh, those deals won't work well. So what's happened is that the private equity model uh, involves you know, some cost cuts in early years, but basically you're trying to accelerate the growth of a company. Your capital expenditures go up, uh, you try and get the best people in place, uh, and the more that happens, it's a virtuous uh, circle. And so the studies that have been done uh, in, in, in Europe show that uh, the private equity business typically creates uh, two to four times uh, the number of jobs uh, you know, compared to an average company in that country. You would think that if you were creating two to four times as many jobs, you wouldn't be attacked uh, for uh, cutting jobs. Uh, and, and this does not stop people, by the way. And it does not stop journalists from repeating the same things. Uh, and so it's not their fault the private equity people didn't tell their story. And as a result of this, the unions got you know, more uh, visibility, and so they press harder, and, and that's basically uh, you know, created an environment where the private equity people have to come out and start talking uh, and saying, here's what we do, uh, and it's a good thing for your country. Uh, it's, it's a good thing you know, for the uh, people working in the business. We add people. So it's a dialogue that you uh, and, need to be having. Right, and, and the industry didn't. And, and because, uh, you know, particularly in Europe, for whatever the reason, they, they didn't talk to journalists. Uh, whereas in the States, you know, we, we talk more. Apparently. I think there's a longer history of private equity in the States versus Europe. Yeah. So it's, it, it's it, you know, it's, it's something that has to be addressed. And uh, I believe that, you know, I may be naive on this. Uh, I probably am. But, but that if you tell people the truth, ultimately the truth... Uh, repeated enough, uh, you know, sort of will win out. Uh, and, and so I, I, don't, I don't think there's, you know, um, a long-term issue. There's certainly a short-term issue, uh, you know, created by um, like an amazing megaphone. But that doesn't uh, slow down deal flow. Oh, God, no. no. That's what I'm saying. So no. I think it's just more talk. Well, what about the tax issue in the U.S.? That, that tax issue apparently, Maria, has been you know, like something that's been debated over a you know, like a 20-year period. I'm not a tax expert. This is not the first time I've, I've heard about this issue. And, you know, in fact, on carried interest and so forth, you do make an investment uh, to, to get that. Um, and it um, comes about when you have a long-term capital gain. And if not, it's ordinary income. And if somebody wants to change that, you know, tax code can always be changed. But, but fundamentally, um, you know, put your money up. If you lose your money, you... Well, well, the concept is corporations don't pay long-term gains. They have to, they pay a corporate tax rate, and so I think the politicians are trying to suggest that public companies are at a disadvantage. I'm not sure what the debate is because the amount of revenues that Treasury would gain by changing the tax code is not significant. So, you know, I don't I don't even understand the debate. Uh, it makes no sense to me, you know, somebody is saying that we have to have a level playing field somehow, but that's, then you can go private and, 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 and work and not be, uh, and pay, and become a partnership and not worry about being a public company or, you know, or be in a corporate forum. I think the debate needs to be, um, needs to be increased because if this takes more form, it's going to, in my mind, it's going to force some of the larger, more di diversified hedge funds and private equity firms to go public. And the reality is that then they could trade at 20-time multiples and maybe they won't get long-term gains, but it could really harm the formation of new hedge funds and new private equity firms uh, because they're not going to have that opportunity to go in public. So I, I, I look at this debate as... Uh, another knee-jerk reaction, but I don't even know what's causing this knee-jerk knee reaction. And, you know, BlackRock chose to go public. We know we can't get long-term gains. We, are, we pay corporate tax like everyone else, like GE does and everyone else. And, uh, How worried are you both about the competitiveness of America today? Tomorrow, Hank Paulson at the Treasury is sponsoring this competitive uh, all-day summit. A um, lot of talk about business going to Hong Kong and about uh, leaving or the Dubai US. today. Or in the Dubai <laughs> Mercantile Exchange, right. Uh, you know, I, I do think we are becoming less competitive, but it is not 
um, for the obvious reasons. We're, we're becoming less competitive, not because of Sarbanes-Oxley, I, I, which I, I've heard many people speak about. I think that's a small part of, of the problem. The problem is, um, is tax rates. More and more companies try to funnel more, more revenues to uh, Great Britain, where there's a 30% tax rate. Let's, and so people are trying to push more business into the UK. This is why London it's is, booming. is booming, and it's so expensive for us to go there. Um, but I also think one of the more difficult issues, and there was an article about this this past weekend, um, it's hard to hire people in the States, and our, our immigration laws are dreadful. It is much easier for BlackRock to hire people in the UK today than the US. I mean, the fact is that if somebody graduate, uh, some foreigner who graduates with their MBA at UCLA may not be able to get a work permit. And but so it's easy for them to go back to their host country and have a great career, or go uh, or or high, go to Blackstone or BlackRock, and we put them in England or or Hong Kong. Uh, 